All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Using Tax Records in Your Family History Research. My name is Kathleen McKenzie, Education and Programming Manager here at American Ancestors, and I will be moderating today's session. This program is brought to you by the Brew Family Learning Center. American Ancestors is a nonprofit organization supported by our members and donors. We provide resources and expertise in nearly all aspects of family history, and we're pleased to offer such programming for our members and friends around the world. Our presenter today is senior genealogist Melanie McComb. Melanie holds a BS from the State University of New York at Oswego. She's an international lecturer who teaches on a variety of topics, including colonial through 20th century American military research, genetic genealogy, Atlantic Canadian, African American, Jewish, and Irish genealogy. She's also an honorary fellow of the Massachusetts Historical Society. She has had articles published in American Ancestors Magazine and 50 Plus Advocate. She is also a blogger known as the Shamrock Genealogist. So as genealogists, we may be the only people around who can find an upside to the old adage, in this world, nothing can be said to be certain except death and taxes. After all, if uh, no one can escape taxes, then that makes tax records an ideal record set for family history research. In this lecture, Melanie will provide an overview of US tax records. This includes the type of tax records available, where to locate records, and how the information in these records can advance your research. At any point during today's presentation, please feel free to type your questions into the Q&A panel at the bottom of your screen. We'll address those at the end. There is a, syl a syllabus available for this presentation, and the link will be in your follow-up email today, and I'll also pop it in the chat in just a moment. This presentation is also being recorded for later viewing on our website and our YouTube channel. All right, so without further ado, please join me in welcoming Melanie. Hello and good afternoon, everybody. I'm sure taxes are very much on your mind as we recently just had tax day on Monday, April 15th. So hopefully your taxes are out of the way and already submitted off to the IRS if you're living in the United States. And we're going to be talking more about how you can use them in your genealogy research. So why tax records? This was an idea that I proposed doing a lecture on because I think it's an underutilized record set that not many genealogists are using. Because it identifies your ancestor at a very specific place and time which is why I think that's can be really valuable because that will help you build out a timeline, help you figure out if there's two people by the same name, for example, and just knowing if they maybe had moved or died when they have dropped off those tax rolls. These tax records can also give you a lot of good information, such as what type of occupation they're currently working at, if they own or rent their own home, and other information that maybe you just don't find in other records. A lot of the earlier published genealogies that we see out there don't actually always recognize tax records, which is why it's another record set that you can go back through some of those earlier published genealogies to fill in some of those gaps. And it just adds a little more context on the life story of your ancestor. Now, there are some challenges with tax records to note. First is that not all records survive at the different levels. There could be tax records at the town level, the county or state, as well as certain federal records as well. And they're often not always indexed, which means they're not always searchable on a lot of the different genealogy sites. Sometimes you might need to go out to sites like FamilySearch or even out to local repositories to look at those records. And they're not always easy to understand. They're often used for financial reasons or potentially for um, counting the number of residents in a particular town. Um, but usually they are having a different context than for genealogy purposes. So it helps to have some of that historical context of why the tax was being used and how you can learn more about it. 
And then, of course, there are just separate repositories based on those different levels of taxation that exist. So you may need to request tax records at a federal level, such as through the National Archives, your local state, or even your town records as well. We're going to go over a history of the U.S. tax system because this is going to help give you context about how tax records are being used and what the tax was being used for. When towns were first being incorporated in the colonies, especially when we look at the early New England, the town was responsible for electing or appointing a tax collector or sometimes a constable to actually go out and solicit the tax that was being collected for different uses. The town is going to use those taxes for repairing roads, schools, paying local ministers, uh, paying any other local funds that need to be done, maybe local militia as well. So there's a lot of reasons why they'd be collecting those taxes. And today we're still paying uh, local uh, town taxes as well that you might be finding um, at that level. And oftentimes these town taxes are going to be recorded in what's known as the, the town records. So like the town meeting minutes, for example, that you can find with a lot of those digitized online. This is an example of a ta tax record, really the beginning of the tax record, which describes what is actually being administered. This is out of Stoughton, Massachusetts in 1738. And it's a list of the part of the ministerial and precinct rates to be collected by Samuel Belcher, who was one of the constables of the town in the year 1738 as proportioned to us by the subscribers and assessors for the first precinct in said town. And this is what the actual tax list would look like. So you would have the names of the taxpayers on that first column there. And usually you're going to find that they are going to be uh, male, 16 or older. However, you also could see cases of widows, for example, being listed there, as you see in the case of Ann Sumner, uh, listed under William Sumner with Nathaniel Sumner. Um, so depending on the t different laws at the time, you're also going to find women listed as well. But generally, you're looking at someone that's going to be usually about 16 or over, and that's why, because they're going to be, that's the minimum age for uh, military service that can occur. You will see something about, like, the uh, number of poll tax that was being collected, the amount of real estate and personal estate being noted. And then on the right-hand side, you see the actual, uh, some of the tax breakdowns for it, for the actual poll tax being collected the amount of the real estate, the personal estate, and it's noted as ministerial. So paying the local minister and supporting them with their salary as well as their home, that would have been at the collection of the town. So unless you were able to prove that you were actually belonging to a different church that was not being supported by the town, that ministerial tax was being collected. And this was going on probably through, I would say, about the maybe the mid 19th century, um, when a lot of people were starting to drop off uh, with different churches that they belong to. And then we also have the precinct uh, rates being paid as well. So you often find that there's a breakdown of different local taxes, as well as maybe more of a, a regional tax that was being done based on what precinct they placed you in. We obviously know that there are a lot of taxes that were being assessed on the colonies coming from England. So some of the bigger ones we're going to talk about here include the Sugar Act of 1764, which included the those non-British exports, including sugar, cloth, and coffee. And really the Stamp Act of 1765 was really the first tax act being enforced where it was trying to recoup the cost of war by passing it on to the colonies. So there was a lot of debt that was that had occurred as a result of the Seven Years' War, or the French and Indian War, you might know it as. And as part of that, the Stamp Act then was passed in 1765, where any type of paper was going to be, have to carry a tax stamp. So this could include documents like probate records, newspapers, pamphlets, even down to if you were playing cards 
all would have to carry a particular type of stamp to show proof that the tax was had already been paid on it. And there was so much outrage in particular about this particular act that it was repealed the next year. As a result of trying to recoup some of the, the funds being done, the Townsend Revenue Acts were then passed. And because they wanted to help halt uh, issues with taxation and also with smuggling, uh, there was very much a concern that a lot of the goods were being smuggled in, especially Dutch tea versus from the East India Company. So this act had allowed that besides taxing different imported goods like glass, tea, and paper, the tax was also going to be collected directly from the ship's captain upon unloading versus actually going at it directly from the people. So that was a big change. And um, the, the Townsend Acts as well, as were then updated in 1770 and removed a lot of the other uh, types of uh, restrictions that were occurring, but the T Act still remained as well as part of that. And there was even a revision with the T Act of 1773 in which the East India Company was really struggling financially. And instead of having tea basically going to waste in London warehouses, this act allowed the East India Company to ship the tea directly to North America. And then the tax would then be uh, collected, as, as noted here, along with, you know, the, from the ship's captain. There were different um, uh, bureaucratic officials that were being involved. And as you can imagine, a lot of this outrage of paying these taxes, especially without representation in Parliament to protest it, had led to the Boston Tea Party. As a result of trying to recoup uh, some of the different uh, funds outside of for the Revolutionary War that took place, Shay's Rebellion was really one of the first few armed uprisings against uh, as a potential overthrow of the government that had occurred between 1786 in Western Massachusetts and in Worcester, Mass. A lot of the citizens that were living in there were mostly farmers. Some of them were a lot of them were even uh, formerly Revolutionary War veterans, and they couldn't pay the high state tax at the time that was being issued to recoup that loss in the war. And many of them actually had their lands actually seized from them. So there was this rebellion that was led by Daniel Shays, and the plan was that they were going to go to the Springfield Armory, seize the weapons, and basically overthrow the government. And this was obviously a very big, um, it, a very big uh, rebellion that was, they were very much worried about how this was going to go. And we had a different army that was being called in to quell this rebellion to make sure that it didn't turn into this complete uh, riot and revolution. Um, and then they found the army really approached them in um, in in west in uh, especially western uh, Massachusetts, that a lot of them had actually scattered once they started firing artillery on the participants. So that's what's depicted in this um, this drawing here, that a lot of them were just running away, and then many of them were actually even captured. And there was basically a a uniform pardon that was being issued to those that had participated. Um, that had basically signed off that they did participate in this rebellion. Now, there were a lot of consequences for this because since it really illustrated how little power the federal government had to enforce taxation um, and potentially even just how to call in federal troops as well. So it really showed that the Article of Confederation needed to be updated. And they went through uh, several different um, updates as well, including um, adding a portion on how to collect national taxes as part of that. And at a local level, there was something that's called the Disqualification Act. The Disqualification Act in Boston basically punished those that had participated in this rebellion, where if you were um, found guilty you and there were names that were collected, you could not serve on a jury, you could not vote, you could not hold public office, you could not work as a schoolmaster, an innkeeper, or a liquor salesman for up to three years. 
So it was a heavy penalty um, to be involved with this. And once this taxation started being passed through the Articles of Confederation, um, there was uh, this rebellion ultimately led to the Philadelphia Convention of 1787 and the Constitution, which really started to enact a lot of these powers of the federal government. The next type of tax I'll talk about is the Distilled Spirits Act of 1791, which was informally known as the Whiskey Tax. This was a direct tax on whiskey and other spirits that were produced in America and was used to help lessen, again, the financial burden of the Revolutionary War. And during this time, if you, in order to help enforce this, there were actually were tax collectors that would um, not only collect the funds, but also inspect the, the, uh, the different uh, stills that were being used to distill the liquor as well. So they had a good idea of who actually was producing the liquor as well. And as you can imagine, that led to another rebellion. The Whiskey Rebellion occurred in 1794, and this uprising occurred in Pennsylvania as a result of protesting this whiskey tax. A lot of the tax collectors were threatened with all types of uh, you know, intimidation and physical violence to actually be in tarred and feathered at times. And this had to involve uh, President George Washington sending in federal troops to, again, quell this protest and enforce the collection. And uh, they wanted to make sure that they were avoiding the issue of what happened at Shays' Rebellion, where there was actually artillery being fired on, on them. And this rebellion actually went off a lot less violent. Um, the rebellion was actually pretty much uh, put down once the army had reached Western Pennsylvania. A lot of people just started dispersing into the woods. The next type of tax we're going to talk about is what's known as the Federal Direct Tax of 1798. Uh, it's informally known as what's known as like the window tax, the window pane tax, or the glass tax. And at the time, when homes were being using window pane glass, this was basically the energy efficient glass of the time. And because of this, the, the cost was really high and it placed a lot of the homes into a higher uh, taxable category because this direct tax required that there were houses that were valued at more than $100 um, were gonna be charged tax. This tax directly was being collected as there were concerns about a potential war with France. So it was to basically fill the federal coffers in advance of this. Now, the federal direct tax gives us a lot of good information about if um, someone owned their home, if they rented, what their home even looked like. And some of these state lists survived, and we'll show an example a little bit later in our presentation. There were three parts. So I mentioned that there were the dwelling houses that were valued at more than $100 uh, was one part with the progressive tax rate um, as the homes were, if their homes were increased in value, they'd be higher tax. If you were an enslaver, you actually were charged uh, 50 cents per enslaved person for anybody that was able to work between ages 12 and 50. So someone that was not permanently disabled or ill. And any other real estate, would, which could include homes that were valued at $100 or less, were also charged a fixed uh, percentage tax. As we move on, you can start to sense a theme that we needed to have taxes to start funding the War of 1812. These series of taxes uh, started to look at things like the actual auction sales, the sale of actual carriages, distilleries, retail licenses, and refined sugar. And this law was then repealed after the war was over in 1815. Next, we start getting into the Civil War with the Revenue Act of 1862. So this tax was specifically to finance the Union cause. This is when we have the precursor to the IRS, and this was the Commissioner of Internal Revenue. And this, in, this tax was levied on all states and territories that were not as part of the Confederacy that were in rebellion during the war. And when Union troops took over certain states, 
they were then put into that tax base. So, for example, even though Georgia didn't formally get readmitted to the Union in 1870, they actually were taxed in 1865 when Union troops took over. With the Commissioner of Internal Revenue created in 1862, which was later named to the IRS in 1953, or the Internal Revenue Service, this formed the system of dividing the United States into what's known as collection districts. So every district had their own collector and assessor, and then it was further divided from a district into divisions with an, ass an assigned assistant assessor. These have created two separate lists that you could find people on those that actually had lived in the division and those that lived outside the division but had any kind of property in the division. So you could be assessed tax based on where your, your residence was as well as where your real estate lied. Next, we have the Revenue Act of 1898, which was to fund the Spanish-American War. And this is when we start seeing of what's known as the predecessor to the estate tax where the tax was only being assessed on the physical estate and not necessarily those that were being the beneficiaries of it. So only personal property was taxed and any kind of like real estate, for example, that we find especially that first 10,000, which included property that would have gone from husband to wife through dower was actually exempted. So in a lot of cases, we're really just talking about a small portion of the estate being tax at that time. And then there were other goods that were being taxed later on, including gum, beer, um, going to the theater, pawnbrokers, insurance, wine, tea, and tobacco, etc., and other means. The 16th Amendment was ratified finally in February 13th, 1913, and it established the right of Congress to impose a federal income tax. And there obviously were a lot of challenges with passing the 16th Amendment. I think a lot of people didn't think that it was going to happen as a result of all these different changes in the Revenue Acts, but it was uh, formally passed. And it, it still has some, obviously, some uh, disagreement from even Congress today of, of people that uh, don't believe in it. But this is a way of where we really have that federal income tax finally being formalized, where in addition to just taxing people on goods, now we could tax people on their actual, um, their, their income, their salary that they're being paid out. As we move on into World War I, in addition to the Liberty Bond um, effort, which was helping to fund uh, the war effort, there also was the Separate Revenue Act, which had generated some of the income. So this would have taken taxes out of direct income, uh, profit, estate taxes, um, as well as other, as well as other uh, taxes as well because it was found that before World War I that the custom and excise taxes had generated approximately three quarters. And with this act, it then reversed it so that the taxes coming from uh, personal individuals and companies and the state taxes were now generating the majority of the federal revenue tax. In 1942, um, there was another tax that was issued out. In this case, it was a 5% flat tax on anybody that had individual income over $624. And this was actually determined because they were um, with this number because they were actually um, increasing the personal exemption amount for married couples. So thinking about that tax amount that you would have been able to deduct from your salary, that was actually increased. Ta Corporate tax rates were increased, individual income tax rates were, were increased. So this flat tax was, um, was, was something that was being passed. And there also was the first time of really creating deductions for medical expenses. Now, as part of this effort to make this seem as a patriotic act, um, the lyricist Ir Irving Berlin, who had written God Bless America, which I believe was introduced in 1938, was actually asked, um, he actually was volunteered to write a song to aid in this tax collection effort, where it actually, actually um, had the song called, I Paid My Income Tax Today. So, and you can actually find it online. So that was a way to 
um, encourage people to show like, you know, I can show my patriotic duty by paying my income tax. Now that we've reviewed the history to give you some of the context, now we're gonna talk about the different types of tax records that you can research. Going back to the Revolutionary War, there was the concept of what was known as supply taxes. So because this was before Congress had didn't have the authority to levy taxes against the colonies, the states had to be, uh, have a, basically had to be asked to provide money and individual supplies, especially when you think about supplies going towards the Continental Army. So the taxes that were issued helped raise all kinds of supplies. So down to the clothing, the food, um, you know, the different materials to build um, ships and pay their troops, um, uh, bounty money, et cetera, all these different means to make sure that they could take care of the soldiers as well as even their families as needed as well. And when you're looking at the supply taxes, there are some really good guides that you can get from the Daughters of the American Revolution and the Sons of the American Revolution guide is really broken down, even down by state, to even show you which supply taxes count for patriotic service. And those are in your handout. One of the common uh, supply taxes that we see is what's known as, uh, effectively, as the beef tax. Uh, on the right-hand side, this is from the Acts and Resolves of the province of Massachusetts Bay in which the inhabitants of, of several towns were required to either supply cattle or the money to actually purchase beef for the Continental Army. As the Continental Army was having a, a lack of food, especially when you get into the winter months, there was a need to um, have this be sent out. And the beef tax is a really good way to show um, some of those local tax records that exist. This is an example from Chelmsford, Massachusetts in 1780. And you'll see at the top that it says that this is to fray the charges of raising the, uh, the, the, quant the, the quantity of beef with which the town are required to procure on the benefit of the army. So you really wanna look at those descriptions because that really tells you what it's being used for. And then you get the names of the different individuals that had paid the beef tax, which are going to include both men and women in a lot of cases, too, and how much was actually being collected. Another type of tax that used to exist was known as the poll tax. There was a requirement that in order to vote that you had to be assessed what was known as poll tax, so per head having to pay some form of tax. And this poll tax goes all the way back into the New England colonies with Massachusetts the first in 1646, followed by the New Haven colony in 1649. And so you'll see a lot of the earlier records will show you poll tax. Um, there obviously were a lot of issues with, um, with it that it had to be reintroduced in the South after the Civil War and it unfortunately was used for helping to exclude African-Americans from voting. So African-Americans that might've been poor and could not afford the poll tax were then disenfranchised from voting. And there was a, what was known as a grandfather clause that was only available for poor white Americans that basically said, if you could prove that your grandfather had voted in the, uh, voted before the civil war, um, that you did not have to pay this poll tax. So it was very much discriminatory. And the poll tax was finally abolished in 1964 when the 24th Amendment was passed to the Constitution. Now, with looking at poll tax, um, this is actually an example of women poll taxpayers in Dallas County. And this shows you... Um, their information on their names, sometimes even who they are married to, whether they were a widow of someone. Um, there's even an example at the very bottom of Miss Anne Louise that shows that she was in the U.S. Navy in the waves, so showing that military service. You see the year that they're registered. Um, you see their birth date that's listed here in the age column. And then you see the different years on what was being paid for uh, poll tax. 
Now, taxes could also be issued out on both your real estate, your land, as well as your personal estates. So, um, so the tax rolls can be really good to help you understand what type of buildings you might have on a particular estate. So besides your home, do you have a formal farm? Is there a mill? Is there um, you know, like a workshop for your business? And these can be a really good way to provide you a census alternative, especially when you can't find someone in some of those earlier census records or even before the federal census had started. So these are really useful to help you do a, a to help you recreate the community that maybe your ancestors had lived in by understanding exactly what it might have looked like based on these roles. This is a an example from the New York Tax Assessment Roles of Real and Personal Estate, where you can see the names of the of the taxpayers. You could see the descriptions of what they had. So a lot of them had like a house and a farm and there might've been other property as well. And then you see the value of the real estate and their personal estate and the tax to be paid out. There also could be different assessor returns of non-residents. So these actually are people that, um, that were being charged tax um, in the town of Harvard, but they didn't necessarily live there. That wasn't their residence. So they might've had some kind of real estate um, that was owed there. And so they, they were owners of real estate, but they were paying out, uh, for example, school tax. So in this case, this shows some of the different school districts that someone may have been sorted into. And then you actually see their place of residence in that second column, which can be a really good clue that if you know where someone owned real estate, but you don't know where their current residence is, you can use these tax lists to know what town maybe you should look into next. It then describes what the real estate looks like, again, down to the house, a barn or different buildings, and how much was actually uh, it valued at and how much tax was being paid out. And if you didn't pay your taxes, there were there were records for that because um, prior to not too long ago, you actually could go to a debtor's jail for not paying uh, tax to different collectors and creditors. This is actually from uh, Boston, and it shows the list of the names of those that were actually um, in jail. Um, and the creditor could actually bring a suit to the court to basically imprison you. And so you note who actually is bringing them to court, when they were committed in the court, where their current residence is, knowing that it may even be outside of Boston. So in some cases, you have some other parts of Massachusetts, like New Bedford or, or Londonderry, probably New Hampshire, and how you were discharged. So you had the option to uh, basically swear out where you signed a poor man's oath saying that you did not have the assets to pay the debt, and then you could then be released or you found a way to pay your creditors, maybe through uh, a liaison with family, or if they maybe, maybe just put you out on bail and decided to waive the, you know, the debt and said, you pretty much don't come back now. So let's talk about now how, where you can find these tax records, as we know that there could be a lot of places that you can find them. So here is a general list of where you can find them. So you, there is a local tax assessor's office that you might find at either a town or county level, your local historical or genealogical societies, city or state archives, the various genealogy websites, and we'll show you some of those. Even in newspapers, you might find a list of those that were owing tax or maybe didn't pay their taxes. Many people have even put together published Bo uh, books that actually have extracted out the tax records for certain locations. And then, of course, we might find special collections at different universities and colleges. So if we take the example of looking at a historical society, I looked, for example, on the Rhode Island Historical Society, and I went into their section where they talk about their different resources, and I noticed they had a section on tax records and phone books. And they note here, they're available for many Rhode Island cities and towns, and that when you're in the reading room, how you can actually access the heading Assessor of Taxes or Board of Assessors, and there's various time periods. Well, I'm not local to Rhode Island, so I wanted to keep searching to see if I could find more about what tax records they actually had. 
So as I start searching through their site, I eventually find through under the research uh, tab that there is a master list of finding aids. A lot of historical societies are really trying to work on this where they can actually tell you what manuscripts or you know unpublished collections they have that you can access that are only probably gonna be on site for them. And as I went through their collections, I started looking for anything that might have the word tax in it. So I could see that there are Providence Town tax records, there are records for the direct tax right around the same time period of 1798, which makes sense. And also the distillery excise tax records, which made me think of some of those early uh, whiskey tax records. So I looked at that one next. And when I go into the finding aid, it actually gives you again, some of that historical um, note here about what was happening. Here was the excise tax on distilled spirit in 1791, which inspired the whiskey rebellion. And then it describes the scope of contents which actually notes um, what years they're included. It, it says that they have accounts by the name of the distillers, how many gallons were actually distilled and removed, how much were actually, um, you know, may have, may have had issues of leakage or damage, um, et cetera. And also the information on the actual tax. So even within the finding aid my, uh, itself, you can actually look through the subjects and see who was actually listed by name. So if they're noted in those records, and for example, there's, it was even an index of distillers. So if I maybe thought that I had an ancestor or relative that may have uh, decided to make their own liquor, I might be interested in seeing if they were included in that index here. And you could see what records are available and where the volume and page numbers are for that particular uh, distiller. You also could find things on different uh, state archive sites. This is actually through uh, the state archives for Utah. And they actually are working with uh, sites like um, uh, From the Page to transcribe a lot of records. And these actually are tax assessment roles for the city of Salt Lake City for different years um, that you can find that they've actually digitized and put online. And just as a close up, you can see that here is for 1858. We see the ward number where they were living. And then it's basically arranged alphabetically or loosely alphabetically by last name and first name and gives different information on the valuation of their land. Um, it even gets information on the amount of cattle or sheep um, and other parts of their estate as well. So it gives you a really good idea to get an idea of like a census alternative to see what they might have had. As I mentioned, there also could be newspaper articles. This is from the Yazoo City Wig and Political Register in 1843, in which this was a list of delinquent taxpayers for the year 1840. Um, and it listed their names and how much was actually owed. So if you can get someone into a very specific area, it's very possible you could find someone listed amongst these different articles that noted that they were uh, delinquent paying taxes. Now, we don't know why they're delinquent. We don't know if they were just not paying it or they had moved or died, but you know it might give you more reason to look into that further. There also could be different tax collections available on different university sites. This is the 1771 Massachusetts Tax Inventory, which has looked at nearly 38,000 people that are living in the various towns in Massachusetts, where you could learn about what kind of real estate and buildings and livestock they had, as well as how many enslaved persons also. Um, this is a free searchable database that you can search. And the way you start is under search by name, you can start by last name. And then when you click search, you'll get different search results in a drop down menu. And then you could pick the specific one that you're looking for based on the first name and also the town that you're interested in. So knowing that you'd wanna really narrow down to a particular location that they are. So I'm gonna look at Ezekiel Adams of Ipswich in Essex County. And here I see for Ezekiel Adams that he has a dwelling shop and shop adjoining. Um, he has no still houses. He has no warehouses or grist mills. Um, he does have 50 acres of pasture so that could, and eight acres of tillage. So that tells me I can look for land deeds, knowing he has some property. 
that you might want to look for. He has 14 cows. Um, he produces eight barrels of cider. So that's kind of interesting. Um, how many horses and oxen and goats and swine. Um, he has no servants for life. So this is actually the term that's used for enslaved persons. And they would be listed then as a servant owner if they were an enslaver. And sometimes you do get a little bit extra information if they collected it on the worth of the real estate. In this case, they didn't collect it. Or rather, it was 20. It was a smaller amount. Sorry. Um, so now we're going to take a look at tax records on our website, AmericanAncestors.org. On American Ancestors, on our website, you want to go on our homepage up to search and then go to A to Z list of all databases. From here on the top right where it says search by database name, this is where you could enter a keyword. So if you enter in a keyword of tax, it'll bring up collections that mention tax in their name or in their description. And there's a full list in our handout. So some of the particular tax collections I want to highlight, for example, and this is not an inclusive list, we have the Massachusetts and Maine direct tax of 1798. We also have uh, various uh, substitute and miscellaneous censuses from various states, including Massachusetts, Vermont, and New Hampshire that we got in partnership with Family Search. So these can be really good when you're looking at alternatives for the 1890 census, as well as some of those earlier census records, as you can see, a lot of them precede the 1790 federal census as well. Now, the 1798 direct tax has an interesting story. Um, it actually was almost lost to history. Uh, years ago, uh, someone on staff at American Ancestors in our library had heard word that there were people at the customs house, the officials were actually starting to burn the pages for this direct tax. I think they felt that there was no use for it and that it was not you know, important. And thankfully, um, someone had rushed over and basically got the pages and we were able to scan them. I, I don't think we lost many of the pages, which is good. So, um, so that was a really good win to keep you know, um, you know, ears out for any kind of you know, potential uh, damage loss that could occur. So this is a searchable database that you could find for someone that would have paid that direct tax in 1798, that window tax. And obviously it is including the state of Maine because Maine was not a state until 1820. Um, so you have the names of the occupiers um, in, the, in the second column. And then you have the names of the expected owners on the right, knowing that in some cases they may be the same if they own their own property or if they are renting. Um, or leasing out, then it could be someone else. So you might find cases of um, other individuals that are living nearby. Um, so you might want to look into who exactly, how, how they are connected with your person. Um, you get information on uh, what county, town, and parish that the address was located in, where they were. So we could see a, the first part is in Kittery, North Parish. And then you get information on the, on the, on the land, um, the acreage, uh, number of perches, and other information that's recorded here. We're now we're going to return to how we can find tax records on some of the other sites, including Ancestry.com. On Ancestry.com, if you go up to the search and go under keywords and type in the word tax in the card catalog, this will actually bring up anything that's listing tax in their keywords or potentially in their descriptions. So there might be this, and this is going to show you the latest collections that have been added as well. So you can see there are things across uh, different parts of the United States and also international as well. When you filter down on this page, you can actually filter under location. So if I was interested in just United States records, I could go down to filter by location, go to USA, and click on that to filter my results. And from there, I could then even filter down to the civic state that I'm interested in as well. So keep in mind, obviously, if you're looking at any kind of federal tax records, you don't want to filter down to states. But for any state-specific records, you do want to filter those. Now, some highlights of some of these tax collections are going to include those, uh, those IRS assessment lists that we mentioned that, that run from 1862 to 1918. There are early tax records for Tennessee, uh, Kentucky, 
there are tax records even for early Pennsylvania. The New York tax assessment rolls that we showed you, there's a period of five years there. Texas, and there's obviously more. So when you're using the US IRS tax assessment list, you can search by a name and a location to try to uh, identify that. And you also can add the year that you're interested in pulling up that record for. So here's an example of IRS tax assessment list out of New Jersey, where we can see their names, their location, um, and even list down to sometimes a street. So in this case, it lists five Washington street and also the post office address and what the tax is actually being assessed for. So in this case, we see first it's income. And then we see, um, we also see carriages, watches, silver plate, et cetera. So keeping in mind, especially in a lot of the different laws that were taking place, that might give you an idea of also what other goods were being taxed um, as part of that besides, for example, direct income and land. On Family Search, there's also another way to search the Family Search catalog to find specific tax records, and you could find a number of tax records on Family Search. On Family Search, generally I want to start by searching by the place. I generally want to search by the county or the town that I'm interested in finding, especially when you're looking for those local tax records. So I'm going to look for Bucks County, Pennsylvania in this example. And then once I click search, I then get to a list of different categories. First place you might want to start looking at is under the taxation category. So there is usually going to be separate records under this category just for tax records. And from here, then I want to look at each of the records for what I'm interested in. So am I looking at lists of different residences, people that are being uh, paying proprietary tax, uh, direct taxes, in this example, I'm actually gonna look at the poor tax list of Bucks County, which was actually done by the overseers of the poor. So to help provide for the, the care of the poor inhabitants in Bucks County, people were being taxed um, for what was known as this poor tax list. So once I find a collection I'm interested in, I wanna see if that's available. So under format, if you see a camera icon, that lets you know that that image is available and you can browse that from home. If there's a key on top of it, it means you might need to go to a family search uh, center or affiliate library to access. So once I get into there, I see the examples of the different microfilm that has been scanned and digitized available, and I can start reviewing the records. And then here, once I get to one of the lists, I can see the examples of the different individuals here, and I can see exactly how much tax was actually being paid out by them. So even if they were not being supported by the overseers of the poor, other members of the community would have been paying this as well. So this is why it's good to look at some of those other miscellaneous tax records to find your people. And as, as you saw, you want to generally start at some of the local levels. So especially when you're looking at um, town level, that's where you're going to find those really local records being assessed, including the colonial records. So sometimes in addition to the taxation category, you'll find a lot of times at the county level, sometimes the town level, you might need to go into the town records category instead. So to give you that example, I turn back to uh, my catalog list. This is for Shelburne in Franklin County, Massachusetts. And under the taxation category, there happens to be the next category of town records. From here, I can see that there are various records, including financial records and also other town records. Those would be the types of records that you'd want to look at as well. So in this example for town records for 1600 and 1900, in the description, I could see that taxes are listed amongst those records. So now I'm going to need to go through that collection and start browsing to see where I could find those taxes being included. So then I'm going to move down to my camera icon that I see at the bottom here of the town records and click on that and start going through and browsing the records. And then it brings up the images that we have here. Sometimes you will get different uh, placards that will show you uh, different sections that were being reserved for different areas. 
So you may need to go through the collection a bit to get a sense of where each of the collections are being held, knowing that it could be amongst other different meeting minutes, vital records, cattle marks, and other things. Now, some family search tax collections I want to highlight include the Massachusetts Boston tax records. These actually are from the Boston City Archives from 1822 to 1918. They have a 50 years of Ohio tax records, and they also have county tax rolls for Texas. Now, you may be interested on how you can obtain tax records from the IRS, whether for yourself or from a relative. And the short answer is yes, you actually can request transcripts of your past tax records that you had filed. So if you are trying to request your own tax records, it is very sim very easy way to uh, fill out a form and get that information. Now, if you are trying to do this on behalf of a relative, the key thing is you have to be made the executor of their estate or some kind of other personal representative or executor, administrator of their estate in order for them to give you access to this. And that's because obviously there's probably a lot of sensitive financial information involved, so you are not entitled to it unless you're actually administering their estate. So this might require you actually having to go to the probate court and be made executor of their estate, similar to like how you might um, try to get other more personal information like medical records, for example. Um, and there is a form and it's um, on the IRS website and it's also in the handout. So when you're on the IRS website, there is a page where you can go to request the deceased person's information, and it goes on how you can actually make the request and what information you need to include. Um, in some cases, you also will have to make sure that the address on file is also changed to your address if you're made executor so that the records go to you instead of the deceased person's home. And if you owe a balance to the IRS, um, well, if you're made executor, you better believe they're going to come and uh, come and track you down as well to pay that balance off. So just keep that in mind, too, if there could be any outstanding debt. And we're going to talk about some strategies for tax records and how you continue to use these. So as you can see, they're a very valuable record set. The first one I, I always recommend doing is use the tax records as a census substitute. So in the example, 1890 is a really good one to use. Because the 1890 census is largely gone and it was destroyed, you want to see if you could seek out those tax rolls for 1890 to help place someone in a certain place and, and year. And sometimes you can get lucky and know that when the tax was actually being assessed and even get down to the month of when they were being issued and paid out a tax. If I went to the Family Search catalog and I did a keyword search under the catalog, I could type in the keywords 1890 tax and I get nearly 900 results. That's a lot of different records that you potentially could be going through. Some of these could be online, some of these could be published books, uh, some of these could be things still on microfilm, but these are definitely valuable records that you should be using in your genealogy research. So if I looked in this one example, this is for Effingham County of Illinois. It was actually created by the Effingham County Genealogical Society, and it was actually digitized and put online, so you can actually read it. And in this particular tax list, it shows you the name of who is being assessed, where their subdivision of section is, especially when you're looking at different parts in the Midwest. You're going down to like section, township, and range information, so that may lead you to uh, finding land records, maybe um, homestead or other types of public land records. And then you see the amount that was assessed, the amount that tax was due, and who paid it. Knowing that who paid it may not necessarily always be the same person that it was being assessed. Someone could have maybe doing it on their behalf, especially if there could have been a death, for example. What I like about this is that you get the abbreviated name on the left, but you get the full name on the right. So in a lot of cases, that will help fill you in on who that is in, in some cases here. Taxes also indicate financial wealth because, again, it's going to tell you if they own their own property and what other things they own. So this will lead you to those deeds. And even just the types of buildings that they have can really help you describe what their family homestead might have looked like. 
And then, of course, you can use taxes to build a timeline. Think about all those years you could fill in by following the taxes over a period of time and even out of different places. So again, think, think, in, think in mind that approximately ages 16 or older, especially in colonial America, if you were a free white male, you were required to pay taxes. So that might give you an idea of how you can tell if there's two different people by the same name, one an older, one a younger, um, if, you, if they were even old enough to pay taxes. Are they even on that tax roll? If you're finding that there were free white single or even widowed women, they also would pay taxes. Especially if you were um, considered a white single woman, you might have been given what's called femme soul status, which means you could enter into contracts even though you do not have a, hu a husband basically to administer with you. And that's something you could file for. And if someone drops off the tax roll, that, that presents the question, did they move or did they die? So in review, I hope that this has shown you that tax records can be a really valuable census alternative, especially for things like the 1890 census and other earlier census records. The records are held in many different repositories, so you may need to seek out things both online and the various websites, as well as some of your local historical societies and elsewhere maybe using things like WorldCat um, and Archive Grid to find more. And while these records don't seem like they're genealogical in nature and they're not giving you full parents' names and information like that, they actually do give you a lot of good details on your ancestors' occupation and what their status was and who they were in that community and may give you some valuable clues. And also, as you can see, taxes are very much tied to America's history, and they help place your ancestor's point of it. And whether your ancestor was part of the, you know, um, the Whiskey Rebellion or the Boston Tea Party or even the, any of the other um, revenue acts being done to fund the different war efforts, them paying taxes um, was definitely a big part of our history. And by studying those taxes, you can learn more about them and also our history as well. Thank you. And now I'll turn to Kathleen before we turn to questions. Thank you so much, Melanie, for that great presentation today. Um, so we'll get to all of your great questions that have been coming in in just a moment. But first, I just wanted to highlight um, a few upcoming events that we have. So first, this Saturday, we have a live Q&A session for our Researching Catholic Ancestors course. Um, this course consists of pre-recorded lectures, um, some done by Melanie, actually, as well as our colleague Rhonda R. McClure. And then Melanie and Rhonda will both be answering live questions this Saturday. Um, so it's not too late to sign up for that and view those lecture recordings. Uh, then on May 2nd, we will have a American Inspiration Author event centered around a biography of Il Isabella Stewart Gardner. Um, that should be a great one to check out. And then finally, we will have in May um, a pre-recorded course, Researching Connecticut Ancestors, Four Centuries of History and Genealogy. This is structured similarly to the Catholic Ancestors course, where you'll get access to pre-recorded lectures, and then we'll have a live Q&A on May 18th with all of the instructors, um, and Melanie is actually working on that one as well. All right, so now we will turn to your questions coming in. So first, Melanie, um, you had highlighted all of the taxes that were introduced due to various wars, and we have a question asking if the taxes ended after the war ended. Yes, so as a general rule, even though I didn't put it on the slide, almost all of the taxes had, after the war fund effort has been, was done, the war concluded, then they were then repealed later on. So you're going to find a very cyclical um timeline in that and i have listed a lot of the repeal dates in the handout as well in case you're interested okay great thank you very much uh then a question here are there tax records for slave ships from england the caribbean and or the united states i'm trying to think for so, so for, for the ships coming over from um yes um so they say uh they're wondering about slave ships from England, the Caribbean, and or the United States. Okay. I will need to look into that. So if we can collect maybe that person's information, Kathleen, I can get back to them on that. Sure. Um, so for 
that person who asked that question, if you do want to email us, um, I would recommend emailing us at education yes. at nehgs.org. And we will um, absolutely get back to you on that. Okay, so then we had a couple of questions about poll taxes. Okay. Um, so first here, was the poll tax in Massachusetts used as a prerequisite for voting in the 1700s and up into the 1800s as well? Yes, it was. Oh, great. All right. And then um, let's see here. Another one. Did a poll tax for Massachusetts exist in Maine uh, after subjugation until King Philip's War um, in 1675 to 76? Yes. So, so when it was first passed um, in the in the colony, it was it was still around for quite quite a bit, well into the 19th century. So yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you. And then um, you had mentioned a site, um, a harbor.edu site for tax records. Um, and someone was wondering, does that include images of the original records or only transcriptions? It is only transcriptions. And there is a published book that we have in our library, but again, it's, it's also like more of a chart. So there's really not the original record per se of the inventory images. I don't recall um, where those are being held offhand, if they're at the Mass State Archives or if they're somewhere else. Okay, great. And um, then we have a question as well. Was there an age at which men didn't have to pay taxes any longer? Um, did they kind of age out? I don't know that question offhand, so that might be a good one to maybe if you can email me and maybe give you an idea if there's a certain location um, or time period, I can look into that for you. I don't remember if there was a, an age out offhand. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Um, and then let's see here, a question. Um, when a tax list is grouped by a precinct, is there a way to find the boundaries of that precinct? Um, do you have any recommendations for that, Melanie? So I would say, depending on where the tax list is published, which is usually in the town records, I would look through some of the earlier parts of that town's records to see if they start listing when the precincts were created. So you might find those earlier on, and there might be some hand-drawn maps that were done. I would start there, and then you also you may need to seek out maybe some uh, maps that would have been created around that time period. You might be able to find things like through the Leventhal map, map collection and other sites to, that might show you some of that boundaries as well. Okay, great. And then um, a question here, is there a date after which IRS tax records are available to the general public uh, like we do with the US censuses? I don't know when exactly they're going to be due because I mean, I mean we have those earlier tax assessment records through the early 20th century but I think it's going to be a bit before they're really fully available. I would say that's another one if you can email me I can try to look into that and see if there is anything on the National Archives site that might describe if they would ever be released for example so or if you basically have to always um, be made executive over the estate. Great. Thank you, Melanie. Um, we're just about coming to, to time today, but we'll see if we can squeeze in one or two more questions. Um, so a question here, where would I find personal property taxes for horses, cattle, et cetera, in the late 1700s um, in the territory that would later become Ohio? Um, I know we currently have our Ohio course going on, so I'll mention that we do have that if you want to do a deep dive into Ohio records. Um, but any suggestions for those tax records, Melanie? Late 1700s. I would say, yeah, I definitely think that there could be some materials in the course. I would say probably starting with the asking the Ohio State Archives, see what they recommend that they might have, and also see what other early records could exist at the county level as well. On, on the top of my head, I can't think of anything specific for that. Okay, great. Thank you. And then let's see, we'll squeeze in one more question here. Um, so I will ask, uh, if a soldier died in the War of 1812, where would his taxes be filed? Under his wife, sons, etc. cetera. Um, any thoughts on that, Melanie? 
Yeah, so generally it's going to be the surviving spouse would usually pay the taxes on their on their behalf. It's possible that the son could be involved with that as well, but usually I find the widow and that would be based on where they're living. Okay, perfect. Um, and then we did get a question if we can share the answers to the questions um, that people are going to email to you. Um, so we can certainly do that. So sure. we'll um, compile everything in, you know, the next day or two, and, and we can email that to everyone who's attended today and uh, registered. Um, but that is just about we have all that we have time for today. Um, so if we didn't get to your question, or if you think of one later on, definitely feel free to email us. Um, you can reach us at education at nehgs.org. If you do have more specific questions about your family history research, you might consider hiring our research services team or using our uh, chat service as well. The chat service puts you in direct communication with a genealogist, and it's totally free and open to the public Monday through Saturday from 9 to 5 p.m. Eastern Time. And to access that service, you just go to AmericanAncestors.org slash chat. Um, it's very helpful. I can't recommend that service enough. All right. And then uh, you may also consider booking a consultation with one of our genealogists. Um, you can use the link shown here on the screen or the QR code as well. Uh, Melanie is one of our genealogists who does a lot of consultations, uh, so you may even consider booking one with her. Thank you again for joining us today, and you will have an opportunity to fill out a survey and give us your feedback on today's webinar. As we continue to expand our webinars and online offerings, any feedback is extremely helpful and appreciated. This free webinar was made possible by the generous support of our members and friends around the world. Please consider making a gift to American Ancestors to help keep these programs free and to create more. If you'd like to access more how-to resources or learn about upcoming online educational programs, please visit our online learning center at AmericanAncestors.org slash education. Thank you all again, and I hope to see you at our online programs in the future. Goodbye for now.